I, the, the chair of the full oversight committee has joined us. Ms. Maloney is here. I'm going to recognize you for your five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman uh, and ranking member for having this important hearing. I, I would like to ask uh, Mr. Armentano, uh, although there is no federal law that uh, that prohibits uh, that uh, that prohibits banks from serving the cannabis industry, uh, current regulations require extensive and costly reporting and impose fines for procedural missteps. Uh, this obviously discourages banks from working with businesses in the cannabis industry, leaving many of these businesses without any access to banking services. Uh, so, Mr. Amentano, can you uh, expand on why uh, banks are so reluctant to take on above board cannabis companies as customers? Thank you for that question. I am happy to expound upon that. Uh, banks and other financial institutions and credit unions are largely discouraged from working with these cannabis-related businesses that are licensed at the state level by the simple fact that cannabis remains a Schedule I controlled substance. And it is that categorization that has been in place since 1970 that discourages these institutions from taking on these businesses. They are worried that at some point in time, they, mon they may run afoul of federal law. They may be prosecuted for things like money laundering. Look, at even my own personal experience, there has been times uh, where normal, a nonprofit advocacy organization that simply works to reform cannabis laws has struggled to obtain banking and credit card services and has lost those services. I know other advocacy reform organizations that have as well. And we don't even touch the cannabis plant and we certainly are not engaged in any retail sales of the cannabis plant. So that gives you some idea of what the environment is like and why, in fact, we know according to the Department of Treasury, that currently only about 11% of banks and 4% of credit unions are willing to provide, transparently provide services to the literally thousands of state licensed cannabis businesses and the ancillary services in this industry as well. Now, now turning to you, Mr. Friedman, in your time as Colorado's first marijuana czar, what economic impact, both on companies and customers, did you observe when legal cannabis companies were unable to access banks? And also, you know that the congressman from Colorado, Mr. Per congressman Perlmutter, has advocated a federal law to allow banking services uh, to those uh, states that uh, uh, have legalized marijuana. Could you comment on both of these issues, please? Thank you, Chairwoman. Uh, so uh, at the beginning of uh, us instituting or implementing cannabis uh, uh, legalization in Colorado, it was the situation where there would literally be uh, duffel bags full of cash that could not get paid, that could not be entered into uh, depository institutions. We had to get a larger window uh, for uh, receiving cash uh, at the, for state taxes. Um, there was a lot of good news. People were very happy about the amount of tax revenue that was coming in and, and how these uh, businesses were doing, but there was certainly a scary time uh, where merchant services hadn't stepped up. We fortunately did have a, have a number of community banks in Colorado that have since stepped up and done that sort of banking, and merchant services now are largely uh, taken care of, although at a, at a cost uh, in Colorado, uh, as those community banks go forward. Uh, and Representative Perlmutter has really been the leader on this issue uh, with, with safe banking and with other uh, issues. And I think it points to a larger issue in cannabis, which is common sense public health and public safety uh, issues such as banking, such as uh, uh, insurance, and even things like mo uh, proper pesticide use. Uh, none of those things can really be addressed because they're all overseen by the federal government uh, unless we're dealing with a world of descheduling and regulation. Thank you for your question. Okay, thank you. And uh, turning back to you, Mr. Armanato, uh, many advocates argue that the federal government should regulate cannabis like alcohol and, and respect state decisions on their use and uh, possession. Canada was the first country to develop national regulations to limit the potency of edible marijuana products, reflecting the wider concern about the potential 
from misuse from overconsumption of high strength uh, products. The U.S. has a nationwide cannabis industry, which requires similar uh, national regulations. Uh, so, again, Mr. Armentano, what are the strengths and limitations of existing U.S. policies compared to other policies like those in Canada? Canadian law also attempts to prevent children from accessing legal marijuana products. For example, they ban sales through vending machines and packaging that might appeal to youth. Uh, see your the, comments, please. And the gentlelady's time has expired, but you can answer the question, Mr. Armentano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You bet. Thank you. So with respect to Canada's policy, uh, Canada does provide some basic national regulations, but regionally, the provinces make the bulk of the decisions with respect to how cannabis is regulated. For instance, in some provinces, private retailers can engage in cannabis sales. In other provinces, it's limited only to government. Um, the equivalent that Canada is equivalent to ABC stores. Um, provinces set the age limit in Canada. The federal government does not. In some provinces, the age limit is 21. In other provinces, the legal limit to use cannabis is 18. Uh, so it's a very, in some ways, similar system to what we're seeing right now in the United States, where it's a bit of a patchwork system. And that's because, again, in Canada, provinces largely can set their own regional cannabis regulatory policies, much like in the United States, by default, states have been setting their own localized cannabis regulations. And of course, these regulations are in place by the states to do things like discourage underage use. All of the states impose a 21 and older uh, age limit. In fact, studies that have been done in Colorado, in uh, California, in Oregon, where they test to see if regulators are actually checking for IDs before people enter uh, retailers or are sold cannabis. In some of these instances, like in California, studies have found 100% compliance with these age impositions and ID restrictions, higher compliance than we see with alcohol. Uh, the final thing I would say with regard to potency is states right now certainly have the ability under a regulatory legal system to regulate the potency of certain cannabis products. Some states go ahead and do this. Montana has a potency cap right now. Vermont has a potency cap on THC right now. Connecticut imposes a potency cap. Other states like California don't necessarily impose caps on potency, but they impose caps on serving size. So there's only so so many milligrams of THC allowed in certain products. Again, I, I'm going to want to have regulation. Cap on time, unfortunately, if that's all right, Mr. Of Armitano, course, thank you. Yeah, but but thank you for that that uh, thorough answer. And now by the.